Well, good morning. It is a pleasure to see you here this morning. Thank you for coming out. Um, the rain did not deter you, so thank you. Uh, good, good to see you. If you are visiting with us this morning, welcome. We, uh, we trust that you find us a warm and welcoming church, church family. Um, if you have any questions about anything about the church, just ask anyone around you. Um, if they don't know, they'll point you to the, someone who would know. So, But thank you for being here. You are an encouragement, each and every one of you. Um, just a few, a few announcements. There aren't many, as you can see in the bulletin. Uh, there aren't many, but just remember, this Wednesday we have uh, uh, Bible study time from 3 to 4, and then again at 7 o'clock. So that, those studies are still being held this Wednesday coming up of this week. And the youth will not meet tonight. So um, if you come, you'll be here by yourself. Um, but no youth meeting tonight. Uh, if there are any other announcements, uh, you can, um, I don't know about them. So how about that? Uh, it, it is a good reminder, though, just to remember that this weekend is about uh, Memorial Day, right? And it's, yes, it kind of officially starts summer, but it's for a different reason, right? We're to remember those men and women who have given it all for, for our freedoms and, and, our, and our nation. So uh, keep, keep those in mind uh, this weekend as well, and um, especially if you have loved ones that have that have died, uh, particularly in service or in, uh, for, for our country. Um, I do want to uh, read from Scripture this morning out of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And I'm starting in, in verse 50, if, if you want to follow along, but if not, um, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 30, verse 50, sorry. I tell you this, brothers, Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and shall be changed. For this perishable body must, part, must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on the immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are humbled to be considered a child of yours, children of yours, Lord, and we are humbled to be in your presence. We invite the Holy Spirit here this morning recognizing, Lord, that you are our creator, Alpha and Omega, King of kings. There is no doubt about that, Father. Lord, we come before you as well, and we confess our sins to you. We are all sinners, but through your shed blood on the cross, Father, we can come and know that there is no sting with death. And we're so thankful for that, Father. So thankful for all that you have blessed us with. Things that we take for granted. And Lord, I, I pray for those who aren't with us this morning. I pray for those who may be ill, that you put your healing hand upon them. I pray that you help us, Lord, get rid of the junk from this past week or what we may have coming up or even this afternoon things that might be on our minds, that you help us clear our minds so we can be attentive to your words, not, not Pastor Chris, but your words spoken through Pastor Chris, Lord. May they have an impact on us and touch our hearts as you see fit. Lord, we love you. We thank you for your love for us and your sacrifice. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Amen. 
Good morning. Today is Pentecost Sunday. And Pentecost in the Old Testament was a feast celebrating the first fruits of the wheat harvest. Pentecost in the New Testament is when the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples. Um, and they went out that day where thousands of people had gathered in Jerusalem for the festival of Pentecost. It was a good time of year, a lot of people traveled. Acts lists 11 different geographical areas that were there in Jerusalem that day for Pentecost. And that's when the Holy Spirit came on them. They went out, the disciples went out and spoke the gospel to these people, but not in their home language. The people that were listening heard everything they said in their own language. And you think of now, we become Christians when we hear the gospel in our own heart language. Not necessarily a language different than English, but what finally makes sense to us that Jesus died for my sins and I can be forgiven and the Holy Spirit will live in me forever and I have the power of the Holy Spirit in me. So our songs this morning kind of reflect that theme of the Holy Spirit um, coming upon us and the joy that that brings and how it transforms our lives. So I'd like you all to stand. We're going to sing um, Heaven Came Down, which it literally did that day so long ago. And let's just enjoy this song of celebrating the Holy Spirit and the first fruits that began that day, that harvest for Jesus that started that day. Savior I met 
now we'd like to sing Greater is He that is in me. Hopefully the words will come. Greater is He that is in me than he that is in the world. Okay, there we go. Greater is He that is in me. As the choir goes down, we're going to stand and sing, Holy, Holy, Holy. Thank you. 
Thank you. You may be seated. I believe there's only one child in children's church today, so she can be dismissed after her grandfather sings his song. Last week was the day that the church celebrates the ascension of, of Jesus when he was raised up into the clouds. It talks about it in Acts chapter 1, where he's standing on a hillside, I'm gathering, speaking to his disciples, and giving them some last instructions of what to wait for, and who knows what else he had to say, but after he finished, as in this song, I'll be singing, if I can get through it, he ascends. Okay. I must leave you now. The time has come for me to say my race is run. But my work here is not finished, no, it's just begun. His will be done. I must leave you now. The place where I go, you cannot come with me. But I'll prepare a home for you. Just wait and see. You'll follow me, but I must leave you now. And I will miss our walks on distant highways. In conversations we would have till dawn. But do not despair, my spirit will be there. I'll walk with you even though I'm gone. I must leave you now. I will send my spirit from my Father's throne. You will learn to hear it, no, you won't be alone. You are my own, but I must leave you now. And even though your fingers will not touch mine, and even though our eyes will meet no more, you will be my hands to heal my wounded lambs, and in your eyes they'll see my love once more. I must leave you now. I can see from your faces you don't understand. But the times and the places, they're not in your hands. It's the Father's plan. But still walk with me. And talk with me, listen to each word I'll whisper in your heart. Now it starts. I must leave you now.
Thank you, Meg and Bud and Joseph, and thank you all for being here this morning. As Randy has already mentioned, uh, tomorrow is Memorial Day. And Memorial Day is a day in which we honor and we remember all of those who have fallen in the line of duty, who have given their lives the ultimate sacrifice so that what? So that we can come together in the church, outside the church, to worship freely, just like all the other religions in this nation can do the same thing. The only thing of it is with us as Christians is we know where our victory is. We have hope. We don't have a faith that is hopeless. And because of these men and women who have died for our freedom, we can at least remember them, at least take the time this Memorial Day weekend just to thank the Lord for them. So if you would, go to the Lord in prayer with me. Father, we thank you so much for this day, and we just thank you, Lord, even for the showers that you have given us. Father, while we may complain about it or we may complain that it's too cold or whatever it is, we just thank you, Lord, for your patience and your grace because, Lord, it really should remind us of all the blessings that we have in our lives. We thank you, Lord, that we can come to this place to be able to gather together to worship the one true God. And, Lord, we thank you for all of those men and women who have given the ultimate sacrifice so that we may be able to do this. Lord, we just pray for their families. We ask, Lord, we lift them up. Uh, for those, Lord, who, who that may have happened in recent years, uh, they have a void in their hearts and their lives. And, Lord, we just pray that you would just be with them and that you would just allow your Holy Spirit to minister with them and, and just let them know, Lord, that you know what it's like to lose a son. So, Father, as we come and we remember, we just give you the praise and the honor and the glory for their lives. And we thank you, Lord, for the freedom that we do have as a nation. But more importantly, Lord, we thank you for the freedom that we have in Jesus Christ. So, Lord, as we go through this time together over these next few minutes, I pray, Father, that you would just allow the Holy Spirit to open our hearts and our minds to your word. Lord, if there's one here that does not know you this morning, who does not have a personal relationship, who does not know the victory that they can have in their life. Lord, may today be the day that they make that decision to follow you. Father, for us who know we have that relationship, remind us once again through the song of victory that we are victors. No matter what's going on around us, no matter what uh, is happening in our lives or in this nation's lives or the world's lives, Lord. We have victory because of one true statement. We have victory because of your son, Jesus Christ, what he has done on the cross and the resurrection where he overcame death so that we can have eternal victory in him. Lord, that's the bottom line. No one else but you. And for that, we thank you. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The greatest American victory in the history of our country was fought when the Continental Army forced the British to surrender in Yorktown, Virginia in 1781. 
while the war did not end until 1783, it was here where the Americans won their independence. If we had not won that war, we would have not won any other war because we would not be the United States of America. It's the greatest victory ever won. In the ensuing years, the United States of America has journeyed on many different roads of tribulation over her existence. Each journey demonstrated what? Her perseverance and fortitude as a nation. As Christians, we're guaranteed trials and tribulations and sufferings, oppressions and persecutions in the, in the lives that we live. That's a guarantee. That's a stamp of approval whether we like it or not. But the difference between Christians and the world is the certainty of knowing the victory we have in our song through Jesus Christ. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, we're going to be in verses 31 through 39 this morning. I want to speak with you about singing the victory song. Singing the victory song. Chapter 8, verse 31, Paul says, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who's against us? He who did not spare his own son but delivered him over for us all, how will, we, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather who was raised, who is at the right hand of the Father, who also intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation or distress or persecution or famine, nakedness or peril or sword? Just as it's written, for your sake, we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all of these things, we overwhelmingly conquer. Why don't you just highlight that in your your word right now if you don't? Just underline it. Just put a big circle around it, star, whatever you need to do to remind yourself of this. But in all of these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The Roman road. Over these past months, we're learning how we can understand our own salvation. You see, this is what this whole study has been about. This whole series has been about is understanding why we're saved and what that entails. We're learning how to answer questions and explaining uh, those uh, answers to those who ask us. You see, that's part of it too, is that if we understand the salvation that we're given, then we should be able to what? Explain to those who ask us what it's all about. We've broken up the first ten chapters in Romans in what we do call the Roman road. Romans 3.23 entails chapters 1 through 3, which says, For all fall short of the glory of God. Romans 5.8 entails chapters 4 and 5, which uh, Romans 5.8 says, But God demonstrated his own love for us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Romans 6.23 encompasses uh, chapter 6 and 7, and Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And then Romans 10, 9, and 10 encompasses chapters 8 through 10, and it's this, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus is the Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. So that's the Roman road. That's what we should understand in our life. That's how we should understand the salvation that has been promised to us by Jesus and by 
God, and that's the way that we should be able to explain it to other folks who may not know the road to salvation. So that's why we're learning these things. That's why we're going through these things, uh, because God wants us to be able to understand the victory that we have in him. Because when you start in chapter 1 and you work all the way through verse 8, what you see is, you know what, we're pretty messed up. We're lost. But thank God he says, hey, I've got a plan, and I'm going to ensue that plan. That plan included Jesus on the cross and the resurrection. And then he says, you know what, I'm not going to leave you alone. When he ascended back, what happened? The Holy Spirit came, and now the Holy Spirit resides in us, and he testifies to our spirit that we're his children. And guess what else that he testifies to us? He testifies to us that we have victory in this life. There is nothing that can be taken away from us. That's why I named this section the Song of Victory. Because we're going to see in this section what that victory's all about. Last week we pulled off the road into a place called Purpose. And we reflected on what this journey was all about. You remember we answered the questions of the purpose of life. Why am I here? Who am I and where am I going? And we also learned how these related to our salvations through what? Justification, sanctification, and glorification, which Paul is talking about. So after this time of reflection, we're, we're back on the road, okay? We're back on the road. The windows are down. The cool air is rushing in. The sun's setting. It's a beautiful evening, the radio's turned on, and our favorite song is coming through the airways. We reach down and we turn it up loud, singing along with it, singing the victory song. That's where we're at this morning, okay? That's where we're going. Paul stated his case basically as a courtroom attorney defending this the Christian on trial when we look at this. He gives evidence from Romans 1 through Romans 8 of why the Christian believer has this victory in their life. And he concludes this victory here in these verses. That's why we got the windows down. That's why we're singing it. That's why, why it's so nice. Have you ever just been in the car one evening? And you know what? It's just a beautiful evening and you roll the windows down. You don't need the air. But that, it's just perfect, right? And you're just singing at the top of your lungs because it's just a perfect evening. Well, that's what Paul's telling us to do in these verses. That's what Paul's wanting us to do in these verses. I want to give you five truths which make up this victory song, five truths that, 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 that gives us this victory song. So we should sing the victory song because if God is for us, who can be against us? Verse 31, is that not what Paul says? What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? It is known to believers that we have an enemy. Do you know that you have an enemy? His name is Satan and his armies are against us. Ephesians 6, 11, and 13 says this. You can see it up on the screen. Put on the full armor of God so that you'll be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. That's our enemy. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you'll be able to resist in the evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Well, you know what? What is Satan trying to do to us? He, he's, he's against us, and, and, and he's looking everything to do that he can bring chaos into our life, to take our focus off of Jesus Christ, to take our focus off of the victory that we have. How do I know that? 1 Peter 5, 8. Be sober of spirit. Be on alert. Your adversary... The devil prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. So you know what? Every day of your life, every day of my life, Satan is out there, what? Against us, looking to devour us. Huh. Christina, 
but God, right? You see that word? You can underline it. But God is for us. Well, who is God? Who is he? Boy, that's a loaded question, isn't it? We could spend the rest of my life just talking about God. Over the next 30 or 40 years, hopefully, of my life talking about who God is. But let me just give you just a little snapshot, a little tweet, a little Instagram, whatever you want to call it, okay? Who is God? He is the uncaused cause. He is eternal. Nothing caused God. He has always been here. Our little minds can't comprehend that because we're temporal, right? We know a beginning and an end. God has always been here. He's the uncaused cause. He is the personal designer. He is the personal designer of this universe. He is the creator of this universe. He created you, he created me, and he created everything in the universe. And he is the moral law giver. He sets the standards. Man does not set the standards. The government doesn't set the standards. The moral law giver sets the standards, and that's God. Why? Because he is the God of what? Truth. The Father is true. Jesus says, I am true. And then what? The Holy Spirit is given to us who is the spirit of truth. He's three persons, one nature, one essence. That's hard for us, right? How can he be three persons, one essence? Well, you know what? Sometimes that mystery, that faith has to come in. We have to trust his word, right? You have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. All three are talked about in the Bible. All three are talked in the Bible all about once, you know, at once, right? If you want to try to just get a little bit of what this is about, just think of a triangle. It's unbroken, right? you got the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That's who God is. He's a God of love. Why? Why is he a God of love? How do we know that he's a God of love? Verse 32, he who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all. Why? Because God delivered up his son. The greatest battle in history was fought right outside of Jerusalem called Golgotha. It was the hill of Golgotha. That's the greatest battle battle that has ever been fought in human history it was an intense battle for what souls and eternity where Jesus Christ by his own choice died for the sins of the world he chose to take on the wrath of God upon his shoulders giving his life for the sins of humanity to appease the payment required to bridge the gap between God and man out of the love he had for the creation he created. He died because of the love he had for all humanity so that he could rescue those who choose to believe in him. Why, the enemy thought he had won the battle. You know what? Satan thought. He said, man, finally I got rid of him. He died. Can you imagine the victory that, the, that, that Satan and the demons were dancing at that moment, woo, put that plan to rest, didn't I? Yeah. But he didn't know the plan of the resurrection. Why? Because the devil is not all-knowing. He doesn't know everything. He's not all-seeing. He's not all-present. You see, on the third day, the victory was sealed. Death was overcome, and the victory was won. What a song, right? Why did he deliver his son? To give us all things. That's what the word says, right? How will he not also with him freely give us all things? Well, what are these all things he's talking about? 2 Peter 1.3 says this. Seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. Through the true knowledge of him 
who called us by his own glory and excellent. What does that mean? You know what? What it means, these all things are, if we back up to verses 28 through 30, which we talked about last week, those are the all things. Those are the all things that Paul is talking about and what, what, what he has given to us. He has given to us our sanctification so that we're conformed to what? Christ. That's the all things. That's pretty good, y'all. Secondly, we should sing the victory song because who will bring a charge against God's elect? Verse 33, who will bring a charge against God's elect? Charges, what are they? That's a legal term, right? It's a legal term. A formal accusation to press charges. Now, who does this consistently? Satan, right? Zechariah 3 1 says this. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. You know what? It was a vision of heaven. There was Satan up there. There was uh, the pre-incarnate Jesus, God the Father. And what was Satan doing? He was accusing Joshua, the high priest, of those sins, of of who he was, of of humanity, basically. And then in Revelation 12.10, it says, He, Satan, who accuses them before our God day and night. So you know what? Satan accuses us day and night, day and night, day and night. Now, he's the accuser, and his accusations are based on what? The believer's sinfulness. Right? Let me tell you, these accusations are valid. Did you know that? Did you know that his accusations before the throne of God were valid? They are. Why? Because we can't save ourselves, right? So then what happens? Well, let's go to point three. We shall sing this victory song because who is the one who condemns us? Who is the one that brings charge against uh, God's elect? Uh, God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns us? Paul is saying, hey, we, we don't have. No one can condemn the children of God. Did you hear that this morning? Nobody can condemn you. If you have voices in your head about condemnation, that's the devil. I want you to understand that. But what's the word say? No one can condemn the children of God. Romans 8, remember way back in the first verse of Romans 8? Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. That's victory. God's elect cannot be condemned. Why? Because our sins have been thrown out of court. When the, when the accuser comes to the courtroom of God and he accuses the believer, uh, you know what? He, he's just an, uh, an airbag. He's a, he's a windy old airbag. Because the accusations are frivolous. Because the judge has already what? Justified. We are declared right with God through the blood of Jesus Christ. Not through our own works. Not through anything we do. The Lord has declared the accused, that's the believers, right? Righteous on the basis of our faith in Christ and has dismissed all those charges. So we go back to Zechariah 3. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. Indeed, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is it not a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments standing before the angel. He spoke and said those who were standing before him saying, Remove the filthy garments from him. 
And again said to him, See, I have taken your inequity away from you and will close you with the festival robes. Then I said, Let them put a clean turban on his head so that they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments while the angel of the Lord was standing by. Can you get the, do, you, do you get the scene? Christian, do you get the scene? You're being accused. Why? Bam, 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 bam by Satan. <laughs> Lord says, rebuke you, Satan. You have no power here. This is what I'm going to do. And because I'm God and you're not, it's true. And so what happens? Satan has to be silent, right? We're not losers. We're not losers, right? Are, are you a loser this morning, Christian? No, are you a loser this morning, Christian? Then why do we think we are? Why do we think we're losers? Revelation 12, 10 and 11. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and our authority of his Christ have come. And they overcame him. Who did they overcome? Satan. Because of the blood of the Lamb. Not because of you. Not because of the world. Not because of governments. Not because of men. Not because of anything else. I want you to hear this. It was because of the blood of the Lamb, it was because of the flesh of Jesus Christ. He gave it for sin once and for all. I want you to understand that. And because of the word of their testimony, and they did not love their life even when faced with death. See, they fought the battle, did they not? Just like we're fighting the battle each and every day. That battle may cost you your life. Have you counted the cost? The guys that are in the armed forces, they know what the cost was. They counted it. Guess what? If you're a believer, you're in the Lord's army, and you've got a cost to count. And it may cost them their life, or it may cost you your life. Here's the whole key. Do you love your life more than you love Jesus Christ? Did you see that in that? Did you hear that in that? And they did not love their life even when they faced death. So do you love your life more than you love Christ? Romans 5.1 says, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ. So not only are we victorious, but we have peace in that victory. You see, J Jesus is the appointed judge. I want you to understand that. He has the final say-so on the verdict. John 5.22 and, and 27 says this, for not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son, and he, has gave, and he gave him authority to execute the judgment because he's the Son of Man. That's why Jesus is God, because only God can do that. Because we believe in and we identify with Christ, we have forgiveness of our sins. Even when, even when the accusations are valid, even when we sin and we know that we've sinned and Satan's there accusing us as well as in, in the throne room of God, guess what? We still have victory because what? We can come before the throne room and we can do what? Confess our sins, 1 John 1, 9. We confess our sins. He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Right? So, we have no condemnation. We still have victory in Christ. The sin knocks us, can knock us out of fellowship with Christ, but it cannot take away our salvation. Our salvation is secure, confident, assured. 
Nothing can take that away from us. Whoever needs to hear that this morning, hear it with victory in your ears. Nothing can take away our salvation in Jesus Christ. And we'll see that here in a minute. You see, he intercedes for his children. How do we know? Hebrews 7.25 says, Therefore he, Jesus, is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him, since he has always uh, since he always lives to make intercession for them. He will not condemn those who have chosen to follow him. The question is, have you chosen to follow him, and are you part of the elect? Because the elect are those who what? Chose to follow him, right? Well, Chris, I don't know. I don't know if I've been predestined to be the elect or not. Don't worry about it. Have you chosen him as your Lord and Savior? Well, I don't know. You're, you're missing the point. Have you chose him, chose to follow him, chose to reach out and take that rescue rope from him and be a part of his kingdom? That's the simple question. Don't get hooked on all this other stuff about predestination and election and, and, and all this other. Don't get hooked on that. Learn that afterwards. That can be a hindrance in whether you're choosing. I know I've talked to many people. Well, I'm not, a, I'm not of the elect. My first question is why? How do you know that? Fourthly, we should sing this victory song because who will separate us from the love of Christ? Here we go. Verse 35, who will separate us from the love of Christ? He's, you know what, he, he first loved us, we not first loved him. Is that proper English? Yeah. Close enough? Yeah. He first loved us. He wanted a relationship with us. He provided it through Jesus Christ for anyone who will come to him. There's a list of things people think that will separate us from his love. Did you see them? Do we need to go over them? Will tribulation, will distress, will persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or, sword, uh, or the sword? You know what? Anything that comes into your life, sickness, suffering, whatever it may be, attacks, or maybe you die, will that separate us from the love of Christ? then why are we fearful of it? You see, if we really believed that we had the victory, we would be going out each and every day and we would be proclaiming the victory that we have to people around us. The churches would be full. We would be equipping the saints and then sending them back out. So why don't we do it? Because we're afraid, Right? I always tell you, the, all, any, any fear that you have, any phobia that you have, always goes back to death, the fear of death. None of those things can separate us from the love of Christ. Now, it's interesting because Paul expands on these in his life. Paul suffered these things in 2 Corinthians eleven twenty three 23 through 29. He says this, are they servants of Christ? I speak as if I'm insane. You know what? You think I'm insane. I more so in far more labors, in far more imprisonments, beaten times without numbers, often in danger. Five times I received from the Jews 39 lashes. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked at night. And a, a day I have spent in the deep. I have been on frequent journeys in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in cities, dangers in wilderness, dangers on the sea, danger among false brethren. I have been in labor and hardship through many sleepless nights in hunger, thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. Now, that's a lot, right? I, I would dare to say that not any of us probably have went through all that. Okay? 
But then here, here's what he says on top of it. Apart from such ex external things, apart from all of these things, there is daily pressure on me of concern for all the churches who is weak without my being weak, who is led into sin without my intense concern. So not only did he have all these external pressures on him, then he had the church. I can relate to that. As a pastor of a church like Paul was, I can relate to that. You have all these external pressures that, that you're dealing with in your personal life, but then you have these internal pressures of the church. So you know why? It goes beyond all of this for Paul. So Paul was speaking from his heart on this because he went through the sufferings of Christ for which Jesus warned us about, right? John 16, These things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage. I have overcome the world. These things, what are those things again in verse 35? God uses all things to conform the believer into the image of, the son, of, of his son. That culture back then was just as bad as this culture now. Do you all know that? There was abortion back then. There was homosexuality back then. There was mur murders, rapes, all this other stuff. There was men dressing up as women back then. It, it's nothing new. And if you, if you can't get past that, then you know what? There was Nero who was putting Christians on a cross, putting pitch tire on them and lighting them up so that he would have them around lighting his parties up at night. Human torches. Pretty nice, isn't it? We're going to have those tribulations. Fifthly, we should sing the victory song because we are overwhelmingly conquerors in Christ. If you don't hear anything else, hear this in verse 37. But in all of these things, we're overwhelmingly conquerors through him who loved us. We are overwhelmingly conquerors in Christ. What does it mean? Here's what it means. We are super conquerors. You know what? Maybe y'all dreamed about being a superhero when you were growing up or you know whatever it may have been you are we are super conquerors in Christ we keep on being conquerors we keep winning it doesn't matter what goes on in our life it doesn't matter what happens in our life we are winners Second Corinthians 2.14 says this. Paul says, but thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and manifests through us the sweet aroma of knowledge of him in every place. Isn't that great? In your victory, is, is Christ a sweet aroma to you? Paul says what? I stand convinced, right? He says, I stand convinced in this, for I am convinced. Well, what's that mean? It, it means through truth and evidence, right? Paul went through all of this, went through all of this stuff, and he says nobody can separate us from. I am convinced by the truth and by the evidence because God is all-powerful and he can bring these things to pass. And he says even if death overwhelms me, even if death comes, which it did, he says this in 2 Corinthians 5, 6, and 9. Therefore, being always of good courage, knowing that while we were at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are of good courage. I say and prefer rather to be absent from the body, to be home with the Lord. Therefore, we also have our ambitions, whether at home or absent, to be pleasing to him. You know what? It doesn't matter. Even if all of these things would happen to you and death comes upon your life, you're not separated from God. You automatically, your spirit automatically goes to him in heaven. 
And then the resurrection is going to come. We're going to be put back together. We're going to live with him for eternity. 1 Corinthians 15, 57. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because he's our example, right? Right? 1 John 5, 4 and 5. For whatever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is the one who overcomes the world but he who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? That's who overcomes the world. So what does that word victory and overcoming mean? You ever thought about it? Hey, we got victory. Yay. What's it mean? Can you explain it? It means overcoming or winning in a competition, struggle over opponent or difficult problems. Overcome means to defeat, to be victorious in a conflict. Are you in a conflict? Absolutely. Am I in a conflict? Absolutely. It's called spiritual warfare each and every day. But I have victory over it. You see, the victory and overcoming are the same thing. Why? That's why we're super conquerors in Christ through the Holy Spirit who strengthens us through these trials and tribulations. Church, this is, this is what we need to hear loud and clear this morning. In a, in, in a world that's negative, in a world that tells us that we're defeated, in a world that tells us we're no good, that we're not worthy, that we should be afraid of all of this and we should put our hope in this man and this process and everything else. We need to hear it this morning that our victory is in Jesus Christ. Our hope is in Jesus Christ. There is victory in all circumstances in overcoming any sin, any oppression, persecution in our life through Jesus Christ. The fear of death, the power of despair, discouragement, depression, and defeat was broken and is still broken through the victory of Christ. The serpent bruised the heel of the soldier of the cross, but the soldier broke the serpent's neck. You hear me? He broke the serpent's neck in the resurrection he has no more power. He has no more condemnation power over the victor's life. We have a helper who reminds us of that. And that's the Holy Spirit that God assures us in this victory day in and day out. And he gives us the power to face each day in Christ. Now, where are you at? Don't know where you're at. But you know what? We're going to end on a song today that's not in your bulletin. As we sing this song, if you need to come to the altar, you come to the altar. You can, you can work it out right there with God. However you need to do it. You need to talk to me, come and talk to me. But we're going to sing victory in Jesus. Just to emphasize all of this, just to emphasize in your life that you know what, we have victory in Christ when we walk out of here. It doesn't matter what's going on in your life. And that you'll understand and hopefully that you will sing this song throughout the rest of the week, throughout the rest of the month, and any time that you're down and you're out, no matter what you're doing. So as Meg comes and leads us, let's stand and let's sing like we mean it, church. Yes, all three verses will be great. So you come if you need to. words up there so we're gonna start with the verse so it says I heard an old old story it should be the there it is and then we'll do the verse all right let's go again <laughs> Let's pray. 
Thank you so much for this time together. Thank you, Lord, that we could come into your house and worship together. We can hear the destruction. We can fellowship. Now, Lord, as we go out these doors, may we sing in victory and let everyone else know that, you know what, we have a Savior who's living and that they can have him too. So, Lord, allow us to share him <coughs> in the days to come. Lord, we do come and thank you once again for all the men and women that's given their lives for this country. We just ask, Lord, that we would just continue to ponder upon that over the next few days. Thank you for each one that's here. Pray, Lord, that you would just continue to uh, speak to them through this service. I just pray, Lord, that you would just continue to allow them to know that, you're, that they're your children and that they have victory no matter what. Thank you, Lord, for all that you do. Thank you for your love and mercy and your grace. For it's in Jesus' most precious, powerful, and victorious name we pray. Amen. Thank you all.